Judith, I wanted to ask you to talk some about how uh, the various uh, scientific studies, the new science of compassion and kindness, enter into this conversation about what are the stories that are accurate about human nature and human beings. Could you talk about that? Well, I do it with some uh, humility and embarrassment because I'm definitely not a scientist. But in the last uh, three or four years, I've been reading a lot of science, the new science of compassion. And there's a very interesting origin. I mean, I, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a religious studies scholar, and I know about what uh, Buddhism as a tradition has had to say about fundamental human nature being good. Mm -hmm. But I've become really interested in the, the new science of compassion that started in the early 90s. Uh, Richie Davidson from his lab in the University of Wisconsin, who is a, a neuroscientist and cognitive psychologist, uh, met the Dalai Lama. And the Dalai Lama and he began to have conversations about science because the Dalai Lama is very interested in science. He has been since he was a young boy. And at one point, the Dalai Lama asked Richie Davidson, you scientists, you have spent so much time doing all of this research and uh, really studying uh, human behavior and human nature, but you've put all of your attention on human flaw and frailty. Uh, what's wrong with humans? You've, you've looked a lot at depression and uh, violence and aggression and all of the things wrong with human life. How about if you look at what's right about being human mm. or what's good mm. about being human? Mm. And Richie Davidson says now that that conversation changed his whole life and his whole field of research. Mm. And in 1995, he gathered a group of six scientists who went to Dharamsala and had a, a, an extensive conversation with the Dalai Lama about this conundrum of how science is always looking for what's wrong with humans. Mm -hmm. And they included historians of science, philosophers of science, cognitive psychologists, neuroscientists, and people who are really looking at human nature. Mm -hmm. And these scientists all went back and began to say, interesting, we have had certain assumptions about human life. Mm -hmm. We think of ourselves as scientists, we think of ourselves as unbiased, but we've operated from this frame of reference of thinking of humans as violent, competitive, uh, individual. Mm -hmm. And they began to look at what they had missed. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, a, a particular uh, primate researcher named Duvall went back and looked at the primate research. Uh, he's at Emory University, and he looked at how we think of apes as violent, aggressive, as in incredibly negative beings, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, barbaric. Mm -hmm. And we think of them as, as very base in mm -hmm. their uh, uh, primitive minds. Mm -hmm. And when he went back and looked at the research, he realized that there'd been a lot of things missing. And they began to find that apes are very kind to each other, that the way they raise their young, the way they cooperate within their bands, the aggression came out toward others. But within their own bands, they were incredibly tender and kind, grooming each other, the way they raised each other's young. There would be a certain amount of competition for dominance in some mm -hmm. of the primate groups, but some others, no. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he began to say, we've missed something in primate research. So in the last 15 years, there have been articles coming out, going back to some of the early research and looking at what the assumptions were of the early research mm -hmm. and beginning to look freshly at what was discovered. Mm -hmm. So this is quite an intriguing new area and there are a lot of implications for our conversation. Yes. The area that I've begun looking into just recently is evolutionary psychology, which looks at the fact that as human beings, as a species, we are hardwired for, to begin with, kinship, what they call kin selection, that we, our, our genes impel us toward being kind to those around us. And then the next step is reciprocal altruism. Someone who's been kind to me, then I'm kind to them. And then what we find in the great religious traditions is how would we expand that to a more universal sense of kinship or reciprocity or compassion and so forth. But the implication of this scientific research is that we're actually going with the grain 
of what it is to be human or what it is to be a living being, what it is to be a mammal in some way, that that kindness is in us, in our genes, in our gene pool, in our human beingness. So that's a, an amazing message in a certain way that goes with what many great religious traditions have taught for a long, long time. So it's very interesting, my students ask, but don't we need aggression for survival? How will yes. I survive? Yes. And of course, in a lot of the primate research, they found that for survival, that is if you're in a band of primates and you're threatened from the outside, yes. you need to protect. Yes. And so the question that seems to be going on in some of these uh, new compassion science labs mm -hmm. is, the amygdala is the part of the brain that is really all about survival and protection. Mm -hmm. But the question is, what are, what is the role of the amygdala in, in the current societies where survival is not so much the issue? Mm -hmm. And the question seems to come down, how do we relate to the other? Mm -hmm. If it's a question of survival, the amygdala defends, it, it sees others as threats, pushes them away. Mm -hmm. But in our current, current human society, mm -hmm. the amygdala has outlived its usefulness in so many situations. So <laughs> when you look at what's going on in the United States today around issues of immigration, mm -hmm. what, what about the other? Who is the other? Mm. And some of the the primitive ideas about human nature are suggesting that we always have to be with just our own kind. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do we define the, our own kind <laughs> in, a, in a world where we need a tremendous diversity of perspectives and peoples mm -hmm. in order to have the creativity and the solutions for the future of, of human life? Yes, yes. So I think that one of the questions, the ongoing questions in the new science of compassion is, mm -hmm. What happens when we recognize that the old habits of individualism, competition, aggression toward those who are different from us mm -hmm. have outlived their usefulness? Mm -hmm. How do we begin to reorient mm -hmm. our brains? Mm -hmm. How do we reorient the purpose of human life to do become a more inclusive society? Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that this is right at the cutting edge of where the new compassion science is going, and very much in keeping with what we find in the world's religions as well. The whole sense of, in Christianity, who is my neighbor? Mm -hmm. And if we define our neighbor as only people who are just like us and look like us, mm -hmm. we have an extremely outdated sense of humankind. Mm -hmm. So that whole question of how we can begin to reorient ourselves. This is really what compassion training is all about, is beginning to go back to the fundamental human fellow feeling, mm -hmm. kindness, kinship feeling mm -hmm. that we have with other human beings and extend that to greater and greater circles mm -hmm. of human beings who maybe initially it's easy to love our children or our siblings or our friends mm -hmm. and then how do we extend that love to people who are strangers or who are neutral that's the big question yes and then how do we extend it beyond that yes so some of this research is causing us to go back and look at what darwin actually said because this notion of survival of the fittest is the notion that Darwin is most famous for. But Darwin actually looked at the fact that animals do cooperate right. and that human beings have built into. So at Berkeley, Dr. Keltner in the Greater Good Science Center, uh, Science for the Greater Good, has very much looked at how emotions and relations and connection with others are, again, hardwired into us, that we have a compassionate instinct, which is a collection of articles around this. So, if this is the view, you, what you've begun to touch on is how would we train in? How would we begin to bring out this nature? What would you say about that? And I think that's the subject of our next conversation. So thinking about the scientific basis mm -hmm. from which we would think about what do we do about this? How do we retrain our nature? Yes. So thank you so much, Galen. This thank is you. lots of fun. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>